thank you, Vicky. It's it's so great to be back and to be with, as you say, it feels like uh, family with OII. Uh, and also, of course, to have uh, friends from the Society for Computers and the Law here. Uh, Bill and Ruth, I saw you for a moment uh, back there. Um, it's just great to be back, to have a chance to have this uh, conversation. And I am also delighted at the format. I'm glad uh, that Ian is here, and I think I saw Richard uh, enter in the back uh, to lead us off in what uh, can be a conversation on these topics. For my part, uh, as many of you know, I've been thinking about and talking about uh, the subjects in the Future of the Internet book for quite a while. You'll see fragments of that here. Uh, and sometimes when I think about the next book, which is sort of what the academics do after you finish one book, you're like, all right, what's the next book? Um, I didn't want to do it too soon because I think I'd be at risk of writing the same book again, just using different <coughs> words. I didn't want to do that. Uh, what you're going to hear then uh, from me is sort of some thoughts in progress, trying to make some sense out of my own book and some of the thoughts I've had that are now a couple years old with, in internet time, we know that's a long time, uh, with an opportunity to see what's happened in the interval and to reflect on that. And also, uh, I really like the idea that uh, we have the Society for Computers and the Law here and some lawyers present. Believe it or not, I think lawyers have an incredibly useful role to play in thinking about the future of cyberspace. Dare I even ask how many lawyers or law types are in the room right now? All right, the rest of you, we have you outnumbered. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, so I guess I should say then, uh, we're going to talk about private sheriffs in cyberspace and their lawyers and reflect a little bit about uh, some elements of the profession uh, that could have uh, a good effect here. So um, it occurs to me that there was a time when it was perfectly sensible to go hitchhiking. Now, I don't know the history and the social dynamics of it here in the UK, but let me just ask, how many people have ever hitchhiked? How many people have not? Interesting. Sort of a slight generational divide. How many people have hitchhiked in the past five years? <laughs> wow. One guy in the back just to throw off our statistics. Um, now, isn't that funny? Is humanity different than it was in the time when easily half the people in the room went hitchhiking? Or is there some other configuration that changed? And I think that's the answer. I don't think people's essence are any different. Are we really worse and less trustworthy? Or is it that buses just got so good and cheap that there was no need to trouble your neighbors for a ride? I don't think that's it either. That's part of the question I have found myself coming to again and again, not simply in real space, and of course the lines between real space and cyberspace are rapidly blurring, but also as I've thought through so many of the issues in cyberspace for which too easily our template is, here's a problem, now what regulatory authority can we call upon to issue a solution? What should the legal holding be here, assuming that we need a legal remedy because there is a wrong, and in the absence of that legal remedy, there would simply be an unredressed wrong. And here is some hope of the thought that there are ways that people can organize their affairs that actually don't require uh, that kind of intervention. And this is a chart I've played with a couple times. It's not really sort of marquee in my thinking, which is one of the reasons I wanted to share it here. I'm not even sure I have the words down right, but basically, um, too bad it's not a room full of consultants, or they'd be like, ah, four quadrant chart. So um, <laughs> you have a four quadrant chart. Uh, one axis looks between what I call hierarchy on the one hand and polyarchy on the other. How many systems are there under which we are operating? Are we all sharing the same system for whatever it may be, or are there choices we can make and we could exit one system or another and choose? That's sort of what I try to think of for this line here. Then there's this oddly perpendicular line, because at first the words might seem way too similar uh, to these, and I have top down at the top and bottom up at the bottom, with the idea being for a system that we might choose, how much is an average person subject to it also part of shaping it? And that's a good question to ask. I suppose if we were looking at our example of hitchhiking, we might put it 
down here. You can partake of the system of hitchhiking either as a hitchhiker, or as I guess the driver a hitchhike e. Sounds weird, but hitchhike e. You can choose on either side whether to participate for supply or demand, or you can take a bus, or you can stay at home, or anything else. And also, it's very individualistic how the norms are shaped and how the behavior is done. It's, it's sort of a free-for-all. And that's what I think of in this quadrant. And when I think, or we all think, approvingly back to those days of hitchhiking, we're thinking of this sort of innocent state of people just doing what they like and occasionally doing something together that can be mutually reinforcing or helpful or salutary in some way. And there are even attempts out there to try to rely on that bottom right quadrant uh, in times when we haven't previously. So this is an intersection in South Kensington, which has uh, fallen prey to the stylings of the wild uh, uh, late uh, traffic theorist Hans Mondermann uh, from the Netherlands, who got this idea that's roughly translated as unsafe is safe. His view was there were way too many traffic signs uh, in, say, the town of Drachten, and you had people just as automatons obeying the signs, even if that meant you might hit somebody along the way. There's certainly an, uh, a traffic accident rate. And he had this counterintuitive idea that if you actually took away most of the signs and direction, you would end up with fewer accidents because people would compensate. They would start to pay much more attention to one another. In fact, by necessity, they would start to view one another as people rather than as objects to be navigated around, as sort of happened on that harrowing trip I just took from several tube stops away in a taxi cab trying to get here. And I don't know uh, if it's worked as well in South Kensington as it has apparently in the town of Drockton, but at least under the right circumstances, carefully circumscribed, it looks like you can lighten up on the regulation and the direction from outside and demand more of people. There's fewer people sort of doing their makeup or reading the paper or placing cell phone calls, mobile phone calls when they're driving in this kind of territory, but expect them to make up the difference and maybe even set the baseline as safer. That's another example of trying to use this bottom right quadrant as a vehicle for social interaction, which is great. It's just like, all right, just, you know, hide under a pile of blankets and everybody else will get along just fine. Now, there are other systems and other calls for such systems. In the upper left corner, when I think of just one real system and top down in certain sense, I would think of many models of government. To the extent that a government doesn't observe the rule of law or have a participatory democratic framework, you're way up in this corner in that you're in the country, you live under its rule, you do not contribute to decisions about how the rules are made, and in some regimes, you can't even leave. You don't even have the option to exit, perhaps because too many people would, leaving nothing behind, uh, no one to actually run the show, and that's way up in this corner. As you attenuate down the spectrum, you can see systems that anticipate a little bit of migration or movement or choice, in America, the federalist system of having different states make laws in its ideal form, how true this really is in practice is a good question, has people moving from Massachusetts to Vermont to Utah where they can finally get the system of rules that most appeals to them. That tends to then drag us over towards the right because there are many systems or more than just one. And as it becomes more participatory, you might see yourself going down here too because it becomes more bottom up. The participant has more of a, uh, a, a way of shaping what's taking place. But I wouldn't confuse this. Uh, you know, these are all arbitrary, right? We don't really have units. But under here, I think of the kinds of forms of gatherings where people are truly active in shaping the rules that they all then will agree to be bound by. That's what would make it a hierarchy down here versus the idea of an accountability moment, the classic election that might take place whenever the prime minister feels compelled to finally call for one, or in America every four years you elect a new chief executive, that is a fairly attenuated form of bottom-up governance. You still have people in position to make the laws and to enforce them, 
and they are only indirectly responding to the populace down here, knowing that they might face an accountability moment, but it's still an indirect process of trying to have the laws and such be responsive to the people below. And there's plenty of examples online of attempts uh, of governments to enforce behavior in certain ways. This is just a quick screen snapshot of uh, Herdict Web, Verdicts from the Herd, developed at the Oxford Internet Institute. And this is something that allows people to report internet blockages as they experience them, a large subset of which is internet filtering when a government tries to stop its citizens from getting to certain content online. And proportionately, these are governments that often don't observe so much the rule of law or have representative democracies. And there's just an example from recently YouTube.com being reported uh, inaccessible in China. And often the governments are completely unapologetic about the fact that they filter. Uh, this is a book I co-authored, um, again, uh, part of a project at OII uh, called Access Denied. And I, I, I couldn't resist but put it up because uh, it, it talks about global filtering and such, like the map before. But <laughs> for cover art, it's like, this is the hand of the state. <laughs> like, there is no escape. You will be stamped with a not sign. And that's the kind of feeling you can sometimes get when you're talking about government up there. It will vary culturally. I think in America, people are far more likely to see the government as coming after them, looking to stamp them, than in other places. But that's sort of the upper left corner. I couldn't also resist but share. This is uh, the Saudi Arabian official account of filtering that takes place in Saudi Arabia uh, and explaining it. And when they talk about the usefulness of filtering, they have two sources as to why it's a good idea. One is God Almighty and the other is Cass Sunstein. And I just thought that was like a terrific balance. It's like, you know, pick your source of authority, whether it's God or Cass, one way or another, we will persuade you that filtering is a good idea. Um, okay, so that's the, uh, the upper left corner. Um, let's talk a little bit about the upper right corner, such as it is. And for this, uh, I've alluded to it a little bit as we get into federalist systems and such, we go rightwards on this chart. But I also think of the market in this corner, the free market, uh, in the traditional sense of a cluster of firms for which there's enough barrier to entry that it's rare for just some person to be able to participate in this marketplace. And those firms can be chosen among, both as a means of employment, you get to choose which firm you want to try to work for, and on the demand side, you get to choose what products you want to buy. And often, uh, in fact, increasingly, uh, I think a recent survey had over 80% uh, of the, those polled saying that they thought that uh, it was fair and important, in fact, to choose one's product based on the ethical behavior of the firm, not just the quality of the product. That is a form of indirect responsiveness to me, analogous to the in, uh, indirect responsiveness of government to a populace that votes for it. Similarly here, these firms can't do just whatever they want if they want to keep making money. They need to be responsive to their customers. They need to retain their employees by giving them the best packages and such. But it is still indirect. You wouldn't confuse who is able to make a decision on behalf of a company. It's not the customers. They vote with their feet, and then the executives of the company are charged with trying to parse that and give them what they want, which is why I would put it more in the top-down direction, even though it is meant to be responsive from the bottom. And for this collection of firms, I tell the story in the book, and for those of you who have seen some flavor of the book talk, I go on at some length about a history in which, in the online space, we thought that it was basically going to be the upper right quadrant where it developed. And uh, there might have been some lower right quadrant examples at first. Individual bulletin board systems. I don't know if anybody ran one of those, where you'd actually hook your telephone up to your computer and wait for incoming calls from people to use your BBS or place an outgoing call to another. That has a sort of anarchic bottom right feel to it. But these, for a while, in the 80s and the early 90s, it was just, which one will it be? Pick which one you think offers you the best service. But for the most part, they are collecting money from you by the hour and offering you some product in exchange, and that would be your online experience. 
And of course, we know how this story ends up. The internet ends up subsuming all of them, and we end up not in this sort of polyarchical, but still top-down kind of thing. We're in a totally different zone, thanks to the net. Now, part of the argument I make, and this is a little bit of a dicey argument. It's looking forward. It's not just describing the present, is that some of the most interesting and important properties on the web today, now many years after Sir Tim actually started hooking up the first computers around 91, 92 to design the web on top of the internet and start to give it a popularizable, populi how would you say that? <laughs> Popular, how about that? Enough face that people could actually imagine this research network as a functional consumer alternative to the other consumer networks, we now start to see these coming about. And part of my claim is these are, in important respects, like their original counterparts. They might be divided functionally rather than you're just either a citizen of Twitter or you're a citizen of Facebook. And if you're really extravagant, you would sign up for both. That's kind of how it would be with, say, America Online or AOL here or CompuServe. Um, but rather, you might divide your functional life from one place to another. I do my searches on Google. I do my incredibly inane, brief expressions of emotion on Twitter. And I have all my friends on Facebook and people I don't care so much about on Bebo, or whatever it might be. You've divided up your life in ways that uh, tend to put you in one walled garden or another. And this is a huge, in my view, transformation. Now, again, I have to prove this point to you, I think. But I do think it's a huge transformation. We went from a zone where electronic mail was designed by the same crackpots that gave us the internet. And it was a collective hallucination. It is today. Anybody can set up a mail server at any IP address and start merrily sending mail. How do we know this? We know this because 90% of all email is spam. Absolutely no sense of a regulatory or technical limitation infrastructure because why would anybody want to send mail that someone else didn't want to receive? In fact, in registering for email, you would normally think you'd have a database of who has what address and a way of authenticating to it, which was why on CompuServe AOL, Prodigy, et cetera, the very first prompt you got was, what's your user ID? What's your password? Validated against uh, previously registered credit card details. Here, uh, on the internet uh, email, no such thing. Go up to the prompt and register yourself as you know, Barack at whitehouse.gov or Gordon at parliament.uk. I don't know who would want to do that, but you could. And when you do, you are representing as if you're that person. Not as much here. At least the fact is, when you register on these respective functional platforms with an identity, and it turns out you abuse it in some way in the eyes of some third party or second party, they can go to the proprietor of the platform and complain about you, and off you go. Now, proprietors might be lazy. You know, Twitter has its share of spammers already. They go wherever the action is. But you have a new layer of proprietor that you simply did not have on the internet and on classic electronic mail. And for each of these, we see ways in which that proprietary layer can shape behavior in a way that is top down rather than bottom up. And in fact, people can expect that shaping to take place, which starts to introduce the concept of a private sheriff that's going to regulate behavior to keep things going so we don't necessarily have to turn to the public authorities. So anybody can create a group on Facebook. As far as I can tell, the point of a group is to either join it or not. And then it has a certain number of people who have joined. I love it. It's like there's a huge protest on Facebook, and if you're not familiar with Facebook, you're like, "Wow, are they? You know, what are they doing? They're waving signs." No, over a million people have clicked join on this group. If over a million people join this group, the thing you want to have happen will happen, right? It's kind of a weird form of self-expression, but we see then groups getting created, sometimes with discussions within them, and here then there's been great pressure on Facebook to remove. Holocaust denial groups from Facebook, from its consumers, and to make a decision one group at a time. And as it's turned out, they've really been ad hoc about it. 
They look at the group, they, oh, this one seems over some edge. Of course, their lawyers have drafted their terms of service, their acceptable use policies, to give them as big a loophole as they might ever need to have license to get rid of all the groups if they want. That the terms of service can say anything objectionable in any way, you know, we reserve the right to get rid of in our sole discretion. But in practice, they find themselves then having to serve functions that have a flavor to them that's more than just the flavor of a business decision. Are we gonna earn or lose more Facebook members by killing this group? My guess is that's not the primary question being asked by whoever is some employee at Facebook trying to reach some form of justice balancing different issues of hate speech, free speech, uh, desires of the members, etc. cetera. Um, Germany's largest web-based uh, social networking site, StudiVZ, uh, sort of a Facebook kind of thing, and they actually invited, with the European Parliament elections coming, uh, established political parties are allowed to establish a beachhead within this zone and reach the eyeballs that are present there and that may not be reachable as easily in other ways, uh, all except for one, <laughs> the uh, Pirate Party, not allowed to uh, participate there. It was deemed not a real person and summarily uh, deleted. And that's an example then of something that starts to feel like it has a political flavor to it as a decision made by a private sheriff. We saw Facebook itself start to block all Pirate Bay links because uh, there had been a Facebook application that made it very easy to send a link to a file that was indexed on the Pirate Bay. So it's just kind of a click away. Facebook wanting to maintain good relations with content providers uh, starts deleting the links, uh, uh, deleting that app, and then they find themselves rolling down the hill. They now have it so that if you include a link to the Pirate Bay in a private message within Facebook between you and your friend, not a public posting but a private message, will not be allowed to be sent with that link contained within the message. Now, Facebook isn't just uh, a service provider. It's meant to be a platform. It's self in a way, taking the place, uh, as, you, as you may know, this, is, this has been my claim in the book, taking the place of, say, the personal computer or uh, what would normally just be general internet service. If you're a young nerd and you're excited to write code, you're not writing it for the PC platforms, even for GNU Linux anymore. You're going to write that code as a Facebook app. You're going to write it as an iPhone app. And there will be terms that you then face from this private sheriff that add an extra layer, for better or worse, of control on what you're doing. On the better side, something that happens all the time on the PC front, you click on an app, you think it's good, oh, it turns out to be evil, your computer's been pwned, life is bad, that kind of thing. Well, here's the Secret Crush Facebook app, which it turns out had some bad stuff within it. Wildly popular app in late 2007, although no one, to my knowledge, has ever admitted installing the Secret Crush app, go figure. Um, and within several days of it being reported that this thing was bad, that's it. Secret Crush is gone. They don't need to know who wrote it. They don't need to know how many people have it installed. As a mere matter of architecture, they can simply make it go away. And that's a good thing in the, in the narrow sense of helping to secure the users of Facebook. In a more ambiguous situation, some of you may have played Scrabulous, since renamed Lexulus. <laughs> Third name, I don't know what it will be, but something ending in us. Um, Scrabulous was a knockoff of the board game Scrabble. And was it an actionable knockoff? Tough question to ask aloud in a room full of law-oriented people. <laughs> My own guess, under American trademark and copyright law, probably not. At worst, it was the name because uh, it started with Scrab. I don't know. But for the most part, probably not. But Hasbro, the holders of the mark in America, uh, goes after Scrabulous. The Scrabulous guys are actually in India and tell Hasbro, like, good luck, <laughs> come and get us. At which point, the uh, Hasbro people say, well, we're not going to come after you. We're going to start pressuring Facebook. And my best take on this is that the folks at Facebook, we think of them those of us who use Facebook a lot, is a fairly powerful, important company, worth a lot of money, certainly can afford lawyers. Last thing they want is a lawsuit of this kind. It's a distraction to their business. It's 
something they might lose, could expose them to damages, not interested if they can help it. And it's under that kind of pressure on Facebook that Facebook could turn around and, as they did, apply pressure to the Scrabulous brothers so that they would start geofiltering at least and not let Americans play Scrabulous. And for once, we got a taste of our own medicine for the number of times that people not in America are trying to get to Showtime or MTV or something and told, you know, sorry, copyrights prevent us from daring to show you anything that we're offering for free to any American that staggers into an internet cafe. Um, over here in Britain, there's uh, certain excitability uh, fanned by the tabloids. So uh, I was struck, I'm a, of course avid reader of The Sun, and uh, was struck when I saw Shank website is aimed at the kids who carry knives. What is this website about shanks? And it turns out um, it's Facebook. And it was the super poke application, which lets you tick a box to indicate any of a number of verbs of what you would like to do to someone. Um, it doesn't mean you do the thing. It just means that in their newsfeed appears an annoying message that you have just done whatever the verb you tick the box is. Passes for fun on Facebook. But um, then you see quotations like this. If the authorities really want to get tough on knife crime, the CEO of directors of Facebook should be arrested for citing violence. Facebook, this is now in the editorial voice of the, of the Sun, Facebook allowed the virtual knife threat as part of its super poke application. Not an understanding of the niceties of a federated model of application development where, oh, we didn't do super poke, we did poke, and no one really uses that, but super poke someone else, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, maybe the sun is right. Given that Facebook is in a position to do something about it, they can easily kill the app as easily as they could Scrabulous or as easily as they could the Secret Crush app, and given that they are profiting from the overall usage of the site, that sounds to, to a lawyer's ear to start to meet some of the requisites for what we would call secondary or vicarious liability. So why shouldn't they have to take responsibility for everything that goes on in the site, if not prospectively, once they've been alerted? When it makes the paper and there's a button someone at Facebook can press to make this go away, shouldn't they be compelled to do it? Now that's an interesting question all on its own, but my claim is this is not just Facebook we're talking about. This is the future of mainstream information technology. There will nearly always be an intermediary who can be asked to intervene, where previously the story of the past 30 years of mainstream IT has been the opposite. No one to go to when that terrible application comes around. And you see Facebook realizing the power that it has on these apps, not just in a binary way, not just to let an app survive or to kill it, but uh, in the words of one Facebook executive, to be able to throttle an app that is behaving badly without having to kill it. You just sort of put it in the penalty box for a while. It generates less news and news feeds as a result. Or they can give gold stars to those apps that they really like to try to fashion the otherwise unruly masses who are coding apps to run on the platform to point them in one direction or another. Now again, is that a bad phenomenon? I am not so sure it is bad, but it is most definitely new. There was not so much a Windows great apps program where those apps would get more prominence uh, because there just wasn't the architecture to sustain that when Windows was a product-based uh, system. Uh, for whatever reason, among those who write apps, doing terrible things to babies ends up happening to be an app on one platform after another. Facebook didn't let them uh, put up this baby puncher Facebook app. Um, <laughs> here the uh, author of it is saying, I fail to see how it's offensive. It doesn't cry or bleed or anything. It just bounces around. <laughs> then there's a super poke app. Aha, see? That lets you bitch slap, right? So already it's like if you're going to let super poke in and you can shank and bitch slap people, why shouldn't we be able to have a baby floating around? And of course, what are we going to do? Let's have you try to um, add the app without needing to go to the official directory to do it. Another example of the refinement with which they can try uh, to affect things. Now, um, I've gone an awful long time without talking about the iPhone, given uh, partially my reputation for talking a lot about the iPhone. And there is a certain analog. I don't recognize this box. Anybody? This is the old Minitel box 
This was, if you're in France, you could get this box and come with it would be the service that was the state-sponsored Minitel service, just like the CompuServe and AOL, but it comes with hardware as well in the 1980s. And the line between service and product similarly blurred as well today. So I've been talking about services, but we can just as well be talking about products, for which version one of this product was Apple controls everything. Version two is to create the kind of application environment that we see described on Facebook. And I see a certain ubiquity coming to this as well. These are hypothetical form factors for the iPhone. <laughs> I don't think you can buy these just yet. But it is kind of cool. Wouldn't you like one of those iPhone shuffles? Um, but there's a certain sense that at some point out of this chaos, this polyarchy may shake out just a handful of winners. And depending on which winners the market chooses, they may be ones that allow more or less this degree of private sheriffness. If it's a Google Android phone, maybe slightly less, although even the Android architecture allows for certain uh, throttling or killing of apps on the phone or uh, tethering of the phones. And some examples since just last summer when the iPhone store uh, opened. I don't know if you've seen uh, this. This is the um, I Am Rich application. Um, for $999.99, the maximum uh, you can charge in the iPhone uh, under the architecture, you could, um, uh, you could pay. You could buy this application, which when you run it, shows you a glowing red gem on your iPhone. That's the entire functionality, thereby proving that you are rich um, without needing to go through the inconvenience of rolling up a uh, banknote and setting it on fire. And um, it got reported in Silicon Alley Insider as, come on, guys, you're supposed to be like, somebody's minding the gate, right? How could you let this through? And within just a couple days, right, one day, gone from the store. It turns out on the statistics, uh, Eight people had bought the app <laughs> for the time that it was there. Two people demanded refunds. Six were rich. Like, what are you going to do? And it's especially rare now. Like, they've got this amazingly precious resource. And I take it, Armin hadn't yet reported whether he'd gotten his commission. He's supposed to get his two-thirds out of that sale. He, he hasn't reported whether he's gotten it yet. I assume he's owed it under the terms, unless they were drafted carefully enough by lawyers that say, we'll pay you unless we don't. Um, <laughs> all of you are like, yes, I've drafted terms just like that. Um, box office app, similar story, gone from the store. The developer has emailed Apple, waiting to hear back, not sure what went uh, on. Um, and here Gizmodo speculates something might be going on under the surface, an undiscovered security flaw maybe. Again, just what a difference from the standard configuration of just a few years ago. Can you imagine if Bill Gates had sent an automatic update that killed the Netscape browser or Firefox or something. People are like, I don't know, Mozilla has written an email to Microsoft. They're waiting to hear you know, what the word is, but we don't know yet. Very strange to see this happening. And yet our intuition, I totally concede, is so what? It's a stupid app, or maybe it isn't, but it's up to Apple, and the market will discipline them if there's a problem. We somehow didn't have, don't even have to this day, if you ask the European Commission, these feelings about Microsoft. And I think it is mostly habit. It is not a fine philosophical analysis that we've done. It's that when you start off open, when you try to close it, people notice. When you start off closed and you open it, hey, it's your property. You're entitled to open it as you like. And people even aren't thinking very much about market share and such, which might be one of the ways you'd make a philosophical distinction. This is an application that let you tether your iPhone to your PC so that your PC could partake of your iPhone's all-you-could-eat bandwidth. Not allowed in the iPhone App Store for obvious reasons. Here's one called Mail Wrangler. It's a small iPhone app written by a third party that you could add your Gmail accounts um, and then uh, download your email using Mail Wrangler. Not allowed. Uh, submitted on July 17th, on August 29th, told, sorry, it duplicates the functionality of the built-in iPhone application mail without providing sufficient differentiation or added functionality, which will lead to user confusion. Thank you for playing. You had our six-week window. You lose. That's it. Pretty interesting and hard, I think, for a market to discipline very much here, at least on the boycott sense. I'll bet very few people in this room have heard of this example. It's on Angelo Donardi's blog. This is not like front page of the sun 
kind of news. And yet, you end up then with a mechanism that's in our upper right corner without much you can do. One other example, can't resist, starts to get into the political. This is the throw a shoe at President Bush app, written by a Pakistani and submitted to the iPhone app store. Not allowed in the iPhone app store. We cannot post this version of your application because it contains content that ridicules public figures. Again, you're like, huh. It wasn't like I was really hankering to throw a shoe virtually at President Bush, or maybe you were. I don't mean to assume one way or the other. But the idea that you have this layer of intermediary deciding, very strange. And again, once the genie is out of the bottle, another baby shaking app ends up in the iPhone app store, this time approved by Apple. So they don't catch it the way Facebook uh, did that other one. And um, Apple, the subject of extremely angry protest. Uh, Apple yanked the app out of the store within days of it coming to the fore, but that didn't stop the brainproject.org from a 15-city national demonstration targeting Apple's rotten core ineptitude. Um, they have asked not just that it be removed, but they want a public apology by Apple and the development of a plan to mitigate the damage that it has caused. And this is the kind of thing where Apple just pulled the app and wants it to go away. But you can see how much the sheriff is being identified with all of the behavior taking place underneath, creating its own cycle of pressure that the vendor may not have been expecting. OK, so that's some examples of instances in which we see those structures in the upper right corner able to behave in ways that maybe, check your own intuitions, don't reflect what you think people might want and where mere market forces might not be enough to deal with it, either because of information gaps or because of market share and market power uh, or even network effects. You've got all your contacts and everything, all your apps invested in the iPhone. They'd have to really annoy you before you're prepared to move to another phone. And unlike the ubiquity of privacy policies, there are not portability policies that give you an easy right to take all of your stuff, your virtual ball, and go home. So how do we think about this if we're worried? Well, here's one mechanism among several. Um, here we are uh, in a city, London, and uh, there are arteries that are public ways, and then there's plenty of private ways, and then there's some parks. And the behavior in which you can engage on the public ways in the parks is determined by the government. And the government imposes some limitations on itself, most of the time, as to when it might or might not be in a position to tell you, we don't like your message, get out of this park, we're not going to let you here anymore. Many cities like this around the world have this kind of structure as part of a Bill of Rights-like set of rights wherever you may be. This is a different city. This is in America. This is Chickasaw, Alabama. And in 1943, Chickasaw, Alabama was owned lock, stock, and barrel by the Gulf Shipbuilding Company. Hmm. They owned all the streets, all the houses, and all the employees worked there. So um, a Jehovah's Witness, Mrs. Marsh, came onto Gulf Street and started pamphleteering, as Jehovah's Witnesses are wont to do. You know, the Watchtower, your latest issue kind of thing. Thrown out, trespassing, told not to be there. She's like, I'm on a public street. No, no, you don't understand. This Gulf Shipbuilding Company, out you go. Criminal trespass charge lodged against her because she kept coming back. Goes up to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court actually says, here's the standard configuration between public and private. And here the private parties have an opportunity to invoke the public sheriff to throw people out if they don't like them. In public lands, it's a little bit different because of the ways in which we think the government is so powerful it must restrain itself from infringing on certain kinds of rights of assembly or expression. Now, when it turns out that you have a town that is all one party, and so there is no public space in the lawyerly sense of the word, only figuratively, you know what? We're going to call this public space. And here in the parks and on the streets, the Gulf Shipbuilding Company will stand in the shoes of the government and have all of the restrictions that the government might have in regulating speech in a public place, even as it will retain its rights to throw people out of private spaces. 
Very interesting decision, not followed since in American law. There have been lots of people trying to say, this is just like Chickasaw. Nothing, it turns out, is like Chickasaw. Favorite example, Main Street USA at Disney World. For God's sake, it's called Main Street USA. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa, how public does it get? If you have like a sign that says, I don't like mice, there's actually a warren of networks underneath Main Street USA. The manhole cover comes over, and they come up and they take you away and put you in Disney jail. Not an experience you want to have. <laughs> Doesn't matter your height, you still can ride that ride. And um, not seen as an example of uh, the public and private intermingling. But at least that theoretically shows us that there might be instances in which as the private company starts to move in this direction and have less competition, there's less choice, less exit you can make as a consumer or even as a potential employee, then it starts to become like the governments over here and perhaps should be self-limiting accordingly. That's one way of trying to think our way out of this box, if we think it's a box. But there's also a movement in the other direction, where governments here, who have been told for too long by people like me that they can't regulate the internet, start to realize, wait a minute, there's a bunch of companies over here that can regulate the internet, or at least their cluster of users. Let's start asking for just that. Some of you may be familiar from uh, my book or my book talk with this example. It's too good to resist. The OnStar system is present in many American cars. It's a little system that lets you speak into this microphone, and there's speakers behind, and you push the button, and this lady you know, will tell you instructions to get from one place to another. If you run into trouble, the lady will uh, know where you are through the GPS and send help, that kind of thing. Great little system. FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, gets wind of this system and asks a company providing OnStar-like services to send a firmware update to a car containing people of interest to the FBI that has this system. The update will simply turn on the microphone in the rearview mirror. And now every conversation in the cabin of that car recordable by the FBI as just a matter of software. You press record, you have everything. The company does this because they can and then files suit saying that this is a misreading of the wiretap statute, they shouldn't have to do it, leading to this wonderful case, the company versus the United States of America, where they anonymously take on the government trying to get this stopped. They lose underneath in the trial court, and on appeal they win on the thinnest of reeds. The opinion says that because the way the FBI asked for this to be implemented, if the people in the car actually ran into trouble and pressed the help button asking for the lady to send help, it would only go to the FBI, which presumably would not come and help. And as a result, <laughs> not an allowable implementation. But if you can make it so that it goes to the FBI at all times when they ask for help, it conferences in the lady, no problem at all. That's the current state of American law, at least in the Ninth Circuit, as to this kind of roving bug. And I am concerned about the ways in which the technologies we voluntarily adopt as consumers can turn out to be instruments not just of control and regulation but of surveillance in a way that starts to sound Orwellian. Here's the FBI again knowing that a smartphone can have an update sent to it that will simply turn on the microphone. And all you notice is that your battery life isn't what it used to be and with an iPhone that's what you come to expect. And in the meantime, we realize that within the populace, we have a means of tracking what people are doing. In a conference last January, the head of China Mobile, the largest mobile provider in China, was extolling the virtues of mobile advertising. He said, you know, this is a huge untapped market. We're at the point where we can easily tell you how many people have attended a sporting event at a stadium just by counting the mobile phone signals. In fact, he said, we can see who left early because we just know who has what signal. There's kind of this shocked silence in the room. And somebody says, well, isn't there a privacy problem with that? He says, no, no, we take privacy very seriously. We only give this information to the government. <laughs> and you start to realize that the technologies in places with the rule of law are also the technologies sold and taken up in places that have less of the rule of law. And how do I fit this into my chart? I say, well, there was a time in America and elsewhere where law enforcement was not specialized and external to the populace. 
the line between public and private much thinner so that the sheriff in the classic American movie High Noon with Gary Cooper would, if there was some important task needed to be done, have to enlist, deputize members of the public to be, what are they, public sheriffs, private sheriffs? Well, they're private people acting in a public capacity, given that badge of the state, in order to effectuate the law. And it turns out that this concept of the posse calling it together meant that if there was an expression or enforcement of law that does not sit well with the populace, there was a natural, non-legal, not having to do with the legal system of checks and balances and rule of law, but a much more direct means of slowing down that enforcement. People would just not show up for the posse, which is exactly what happened when the North and the South in America reached a political accommodation among elites about the treatment of fugitive slaves. They would be taken from the North, where they were nominally trying to be free, and escorted back to the South by a sheriff with a posse. And the sheriffs found that the posses just couldn't be bothered to show up for this purpose, and that became a dead letter law. In our modern society, we don't have this anymore. We expect a professionalized level of enforcement of our laws and surveillance of us for national security or law enforcement purposes that if it is to be cabined at all, should be cabined by other law, by other branches, by other legal process, not by the people themselves simply able to resist. I say this, of course, knowing I'm in a city full of CCTVs that has exactly this kind of idea behind it. But I say we might be losing something precious when it turns out that the participatory nature here, the posse needed to assist the sheriff up here, starts to evaporate. Okay, we still have the problem of this is sort of, as I'm laying it out, the idyllic zone where people just do whatever they want. But of course, when they do whatever they want, problems will arise. That's why we don't hitchhike anymore. So what do we do about it? Well, so far, classically, we reach up to private alternatives for security. For your virus provider, you have a choice. Do you want McAfee? Do you want Symantec? Or we look to the government for help. There needs to be a new cybercrime treaty, and we need new law enforcement that will look into those who are doing malfeasance in cyberspace with all the attendant problems of jurisdiction, of identifying wrongdoers, all of that. Not great, but you figure that's what we've got. But I say, well, what about this corner down here? Is there something we could do to actually take some of the norms that kept the peace for a while over here and start to instantiate them in a way that maybe you don't make it optional. Because if you make it optional, the bad apple simply chooses not to participate in the system and just to be bad. But we have examples down here of bottom-up enterprises shaped and run by the people that they also govern with very little gap between the two that actually can end up affecting bad apples. And there are ways that norms and practices can become a reality. So this is just a quick example uh, on the positive side of things. This is an experiment done by a colleague at NYU called TweenBots. And she set up these little cardboard robots with the all-important smiley face on them and a flag saying, this is where I'm trying to go, and a very lame engine that simply propelled the thing very slowly forward towards you know, inevitable danger, right? And passersby would look at this and actually pick it up and put it in the right direction to wherever it was trying to go and to avoid obstacles. They didn't call the bomb squad, don't ask me why, but <laughs> they would in fact help it. So here's one of these tween bots in the northeast corner of Washington Square Park with a flag that says I'm trying to get to here on West 4th Street and 43 people independently intervened to send the thing on its way. A kind of spontaneous barn raising. Now, if you knew that this was a pay service, it's like Tweenbox Inc. will get your robot to where it needs to go, I'm not sure you would as readily decide to be helpful. This is just, I don't know, it has a smiley, it must be good kind of thing. But it does show there's a reservoir that you can draw on of goodwill if only you know how to put the flag in front of people's eyes. This is what I see with the now ubiquitous robots.txt, which is an easy way for a website to express what robots, like the Google crawler, are allowed to look at and aren't. And by allowed, it is an expression of preference. At the time, this was made and ratified by no standards body. This was an informal agreement among people on a mailing list. 
This was meant to be a way to express a request, not a demand. And to this day, most robots, certainly the big ones, respect robots.txt and will not go where they are told not to go. And most researchers, in part to my dismay at OII and elsewhere, feel that they owe respect to this request, even if it throws off their data, because your robot isn't supposed to go there. Now, that may vary at OII. We can talk about that. But fascinating, the power of this norm for somebody to make a request and have it respected, not because somebody thinks they will pay legally if they don't, but simply because they think it's the right thing to do. And I see the glimmerings of that kind of respect, not just at the technical layer with things like robots.txt, but also above at the social layer. And if we can develop technology like robots.txt, the way that Creative Commons develop technology to signal your intentions as an author with respect to your work, what you want people to do or not with it through technical tagging, I feel you can do the same here. This is a, a, a snarky blog that includes bad pictures from portrait studios. You all know what these are. Uh, so Olin Mills is one of the big American ones. Olin Mills backdrop number four, bucolic meadow with split rail fence. Is that an animal carcass behind her? And you actually look and you're like, I think that's an animal carcass behind. <laughs> what was Olin Mills thinking? And there's one after the other of kind of interesting photos this way until you hit this one. Image removed at request of owner. And I genuinely believe this is a request of the owner. Onerously made because he had to find the person running the site and send an email or whatever it is. But it actually turns out you ask, the guy's like, all right, it's not crucial for my site for it to be there. If there's a mechanism by which to ask, and I think these mechanisms can be made far more regular, I actually think that we can find people, at least a critical mass of people, starting to respect it and taking the sting out of some of the viral nature of the ills of invasion of privacy that we see online. We may even see ways of automating this kind of request so that it's just built into the fabric of the shirt. And then you have a camera, and when you take a picture, you as the picture taker can decide whether or not you want to respect the tag. It's not disempowering the person with the camera. It's giving the person with the camera an opportunity to make an ethical choice that in the absence of this kind of technical infrastructure to signal to the cameras at large what your preference is. And it might not just be binary, it might be contact me. Let me know if you want to use the photo and we can talk kind of thing. And then the person with the photo can make an ethical choice also depending on circumstance. If it's a big crowd shot at a stadium, hey, I'm not going to start blurring faces. But if it's something that's very individualistic, Maybe I will respect it. These are ethical opportunities we simply haven't had a chance to experience. So um, Wikipedia, another great example. As some of you know, I've devoted an entire chapter to Wikipedia in my book. The things that interest me most about Wikipedia are the ways in which there are governance mechanisms within that try as best they can, and there are many, many critics of it, to incorporate people themselves who step forward to say, they are unhappy with what they see on Wikipedia. They are the subject of something on Wikipedia. There's others at OII studying this with some amazing empirical research. And when you look at Wikipedia, if you look deeply, you'll see pages like the Administrator's Notice Board, which is itself a wiki page, where people just post one problem after another. And administrators, who are people who identify as Wikipedians, not usually more than that, come in and solve the problems. And it's the fact that they are solving the problems faster than the problems are arriving on the page that you end up with a Wikipedia that works to the extent that it does. And sometimes people even self-organize in units, like the counter-vandalism unit, to go out and scrub Wikipedia of vandalism. Could we imagine such a thing for the local parks? Well, so long as we know there are public authorities and it's their job to keep the damn park clean, my job is to vote them out if I don't like the way the park is. Again, without the barriers, think back to uh, South Kensington, people start to organize in order to take responsibility for themselves. One other example on this front, some of you may have heard of Star Wars Kid. How many people have experienced Star Wars Kid? All right, poor Canadian fellow who filmed himself with a camera on a tripod using a golf ball retriever as if it were a Jedi sword. <laughs> Don't do that. He does it. It turns out to make a very goofy video this video uploaded by so-called friends who find it because it was a school recorder that was used. And this thing goes madly viral. Hundreds of millions of views and derivative works, many of which are very funny, of Star Wars Kid. 
Star Wars kid hates this. Not something he wants to have happen. And in one corner of the internet, <laughs> right, the internet's paper of record, Wikipedia, has an entry about Star Wars Kid. Star Wars Kid is an internet phenomenon which started when a 14-year-old French Canadian high school student, etc., etc. One thing you will not find in this article, his name. And it turns out that on every page on Wikipedia, there's this corresponding discussion page. And if you look at the discussion, you can see back in 2005, they're talking about whether his name should be on the page. And there's great disagreement about it. And as you read this debate, you find yourself kind of getting persuaded each way. And then you settle into a view. And the Wikipedians decide in their own consensus kind of way, no. The mainstream press has his name all over the place, but Wikipedia isn't going to do it. And it turns out that years later, 2008, they're still arguing about it. But guess what, lawyers in the room? They've invented stare decisis. They've invented the idea that previous decisions should not be reviewed de novo. <laughs> it's like, wow, <laughs> that's a great idea. You know, we've already been through this. If you want to argue it, OK, but it better be clear error below before we're going to change the view. And then you see people able both to argue on the merits and then, as lawyers can do, to start arguing in the procedure so that even if you disagree with the policy, you have other reasons to sort of maintain a kind of stability and consistency to what you see. Wikipedia is inventing this in an amazing organic fashion with all of the stumbles you would expect as it, as an instrument on the internet, is drifting from the lower right as just another website over to be something for which even if you don't use Wikipedia, if there's something bad about you on it, it's probably going to concern you because of just how central and precious it is. Um, there's now actually a uh, note up here that says, under this policy, it has been decided by the majority not to include any mention of the subject's real name. Any addition to the real name will be removed immediately and could lead to sanctions against the editor adding the information. They mean business about this, and there are people who are keeping vigilant watch. OK, so that's some account of the lower left corner. This is a coming together from 1999 of people led by a guy named Paul Vixie, one of the internet uh, architects, to try to stop spam. Paul would keep a list of those internet protocol addresses that he thought were spammers or involved with spamming, mail servers that had been involved with spamming. One artifact of that would mean that if you tried to email Paul from one of those lists, you couldn't get there. All right, well, that's nice. But another artifact is Paul would make his list available in real time, thereby creating the real time black hole list. And if you got added to Paul's list, not only could you not email Paul, but it turns out Hotmail subscribed to Paul's list. So no one on Hotmail would get mail from you if Paul decided you were a bad person. Incredible expression of power. And it turns out it started out polyarchically. There were actually other lists. There was Orbs, British list, the Open Relay Behavior Modification System. Totally automated way of trying to identify if your email server could be used to send spam. And if so, sent an automatic email that says you have 12 hours to comply or you will be blacklisted on Orbs. I once asked Paul about Orbs and what he thought, and he said, um, he said, yeah, I, I don't really like what they do. It's all too automated. There's no human element to orbs like there is for the real-time black hole list. He said, in fact, I think that they, they probe your server by sending a test email to themselves. And if they can get it, it means that you're possibly uh, uh, abusable by spammers. He says, I feel like that test email is spam. I said, what did you do? He said, I blacklisted them. <laughs> I said, what did they do? He said, they blacklisted me. <laughs> and you start to realize that it's not all you know, buttercups and rainbows in this corner. But there's some sense that even the creatures up here are starting to realize that their citizenry, such as it is, are feeling a kind of ownership that isn't just capturable by market and consumer terms. So I don't know how many people participated in the Facebook governance vote. Anybody? Yes? Now, I've likened this publicly to, uh, they managed to focus it to two alternatives. And it's kind of like, would you like your green pajamas or your red pajamas when I put you to bed right now kind of thing. <laughs> it's like the illusion of choice in some way. But it also can harness a kind of civic instinct that I think could run away with the whole idea. That Facebook doesn't know exactly how powerful the fire is that they're playing with in a good way trying to imagine inviting people to have some hand 
in directly governing Facebook, trying to move the phenomenon down in order to satisfy people. Our own efforts at uh, the Berkman Center and at OII of things like Stop Badware have a similar flavor that we haven't figured out yet. This is a Stop Badware site that when there are websites that spew out bad stuff, um, we in cooperation with Google will label it as such. So when my good friend and colleague Yochai Benkler's book was put in a wiki and turned out to be bad on the site, um, it got labeled uh, because somebody edited the wiki to add a virus with this message, this site may harm your computer if you search for it in Google. If you click on the link anyway, you get this page. It's like, no, really, you're not going, we're not going to take you to this site because we think it's bad. That's a real, wow, something over in this zone because so many people use Google. Webmasters who have had their sites listed do find their traffic drop precipitously, and it actually incents them to clean up whatever occasions the message. But you also start to realize just how powerful that point of control is and we've been aspiring to figure out how to include the public in these determinations, in the inevitable appeals that follow, sometimes thousands of appeals a week coming from sites that have been listed, how to make that have some of the elements of rule of law, notice an opportunity to be heard, due process, whatever that means, jury of your peers, whatever that means, the elements that we expect lawyers to help us build in so that our systems are not just, hey, if you don't like it, buy another product, use another search engine, or go somewhere else. So these are just a few thoughts on the ways in which there will be sheriffs. That we know. What the sheriffs will answer to and how much our instincts tell us we should care about what they do in ways other than affecting them in just market force ways. That's to me what will make the next several years in cyberspace extremely interesting. And with that, I would love to open it up to discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure as always. Um, we, we, we do have uh, Sonny Ian. And did I see Richard? Oh, no. Richard, are you still happy to give a few comments as well? Fantastic. Could you, could you come up to the front as well? Um, we thought we'd have a couple of respondents precisely because this is supposed to be a sort of dialogue between academic <laughs> research, legal practitioners, and sort of policy communities. So um, I've got two respondents here this evening who I, you may or may not know already. Uh, Dr. Ian Brown, who does, as senior research fellow at the OII, some of our most important work around policy and the internet at the moment. Um, he's principal investigator on two very relevant projects to what we've been talking about this evening, the Privacy Values Network and the Future Internet. But you probably most know his work in relation to a report that he co-authored came out two weeks ago now, three weeks ago now, um, called The Database State, which you will have seen picked up all over the newspapers. Uh, they reported it as the fact that 25% sort of, of government databases broke uh, privacy legislation. I'll try to be quick. Thank you, Jonathan. Thought-provoking, thought as always, and I was sort of scribbling away, but I'll, I'll try and skip through my thoughts. Um, five brief thoughts. Firstly, particularly around security, I was interested that you, what you didn't touch on in your, in your talk, um, which is something which in some ways seems to be these days the prevailing um, best practice idea from people like the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee about online security is, well, actually, what you really need to look at is the market ordering function of law and especially assigning liability to software producers, to ISPs and to financial services institutions in a way. I suppose that's the, the hierarchical top-down bit, the ordering, but then which leads to a totally polyarchical bottom-up um, individuals functioning in a, in a free market way which properly assigns risk and, and uh, incentivizes people to act in, in ways that will in, in enhance security. Um, second point, I'm, I'm interested to see how far private regulation, as, as you, were, you were discussing, um, can be maintained in the face of genuine market competition because, of course, it, the reason that people like Google and Facebook are so powerful, as you said, is that they have such a dominant position in the market. It's very hard for consumers who dislike how they act to switch away. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see, I think, with Android, whether that slightly more open platform um, does really significantly challenge iPhone in the market, just because the functionality perhaps will expand so much more, quick, more quickly in the way that open source software has a very fast innovation cycle. Uh, and even whether competition regulators might start at, um, to look at um, ex-ante regulation of those kind of platforms to force them to open up to, to minimise switching costs in the way that they do with mobile with telephones, for example, um, to allow to to require interoperability uh, in 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 
ways that other competition regulation is done. Um, third point, um, actually going back to your book, uh, generativity and the, 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 the open platform of the PC and the internet that we still have by and large today, and doesn't seem to be going away um, so far, and how much of a challenge that presents and how much that limits the abilities of the platforms to regulate their users, because if they go too far, people can always switch to code that they're running on their own machines that will avoid those restrictions. I think the only really significant challenge we've seen to that in a legal sense so far um, has been uh, the, uh, the, the large rights holders in the UK and elsewhere trying to persuade, as one of their responses to file sharing, um, governments to acquire internet service providers to monitor peer-to-peer -peer communications, even to go as far as trying to to spot when copyrighted works are being exchanged by users automatically by fingerprinting them. Um, that doesn't seem to have got anywhere legislatively, thank goodness. I mean, I always say, have you heard of encryption? And most of them haven't when I, when I ask them that question, um, which is a bit of a problem for that, that mode of regulation. Um, fourth point, um, I think it's a, it's a really interesting political philosophy question about agency. How far is the, is the autonomy and, and agency of individuals in future dependent on their ability to control code that's running on their own systems as opposed to, say, running on a third-party platform? Um, the, the, the Chinese example was interesting and the, the FBI example, thinking through... Um, I mean, the, the, the one good thing I would have to say about the FBI and their their OnStar snooping application is at least it was selective. At least they were looking at specific individuals that they had some cause to suspect, and you could, of course, insert layers of judicial... Yeah, listen to all the cars and waiting for somebody to say bye. Well, exactly, as, as we have, for example, with the Data Retention Directive in the European Union, where you just say, OK, well, let's just treat all 500 million European citizens as criminals in waiting, um, record information about who they're talking to, uh, the UK government would like to go a lot further with their, their intercept modernization program. Uh, I definitely don't think that's the way forward. If you're, if you're someone that thinks human rights and privacy um, is important, as I do, I'm doing a study for the European Commission at the moment about how new technologies are impacting on the data protection regulation framework in Europe. And I think one of the core points our team is going to make is that um, the data protection framework has to put more emphasis on regulating the designers of systems to build in privacy, because it's much, much easier to have effective privacy protection in systems if it's designed in from the start, rather than trying to, you know, it's almost not worth bothering trying to bolt it on at the end, because it tends just not to work. And finally, on the, the, the rule of law question, I think is, is, is very interesting, but also raised. Um, I was dismayed to read the, uh, the House of Lords debate uh, just a week or two ago about um, surveillance where Lord, Lord Wolfe and Lord Hoffman and others um, decided to have a little rant about the European Court of Human Rights decision, Marpa, S and Marpa versus the UK, which was about the DNA database. Uh, it, th that was really interesting because that's one of the first cases where the European Court has really, really looked at these questions of how technological systems like the DNA database in the UK impact on human rights. And the whole UK court system had got it wrong from their perspective, all the way up to the Court of Appeal had said, this is fine. You know, within the European framework, you know, with, with, the, with the Human Rights Act there, they said, no, this is not, uh, you know, this is fine. This is a proportionate intrusion into people's private lives, given the, um, the quite understandable uh, objective of the state in doing that, and the European Court of Human Rights. It's a very interesting decision, S and Martha. I, I highly recommend it. They slate the whole approach that had been taken by the UK government and the courts, saying, no, it's not necessary or proportionate in a democratic society. So I hope that you, you get somewhere eventually in educating the, the certain parts of the ju judiciary in this country uh, on, on that, because I think it's important. And I think without that, that does damage the rule of law, because... Uh, uh, another consequence it has, I had a, a really interesting discussion with um, Joel Reidenberg in, at a conference in New York uh, in March on regulating intermediaries in the information society, exactly this question. Uh, and how, f in Joel's, from Joel's perspective, I thought, I hadn't heard this perspective before. I thought it was interesting and, and stimulating, although I disagreed with it. He thought that the people, the, the hackers, the people writing the file sharing software, and deliberately changing it um, to get round court decisions, in effect. You know, so the, the first generation file sharing software, Napster, was shut down um, by the Californian courts because it was dependent on a small number of servers running in 
the Californian jurisdiction, jurisdiction well, of course, the, the file sharing software authors changed it so that the, the search function was also decentralized and couldn't be shut down so easily. And Joel's perspective was they are, that is fundamentally anti-rule of law, these, these software authors trying to get round decisions of the judiciary. And, and my response was, well, unfortunately to me, the rule of law only has legitimacy if it comes from a legitimate political process. And I would say in the case of copyright law, and in the case of some other laws, actually privacy law would be one of them, I would say it does not have genuine legitimacy in that sense because it's so captured by a small number of um, interests on copyright, the large rights holders, on privacy, seemingly the, the intelligence agencies, the law enforcement sector in the, in the UK particularly seem to be the only voice that counts in the policy making process. Therefore, I feel much less strongly than Joel does that people writing software to, in effect, get round laws and judgments um, are, are perhaps less illegitimate than Joel thought. Thank you.